Van talked about the first part of TA being structural analysis, looking at how each of us as individuals are structured. And the notion that this is an ego state model, so what we're looking at are, how, are things that we can see. And in this exercise, you can see each of the three ego states in the folks. The, we are, when we're born the child ego state, we're born with, in our, with our child, all child ego state, and we'll talk about some nuances of that, but the child ego state is, is what we come into the world with, and then we develop our adult and our parent ego state over time. So that's called first order structural analysis. And each of us um, has, has the capacity, as, we were, as Vanna said, to have all three, and I was interested in listening to people talking already about their about awareness of where am I, um, how am I using my ego states? And that's one of the pieces of work is to notice which of the ego states are do I use more free, more easily, which are more difficult for me to access, and how come? So we'll be talking more about that. And then the um, second piece of uh, the notion of structural analysis is how do my ego states function. So there are five parts of that, which I'll just sum, you know, the first, in the child, we, de we uh, develop a, a natural, the free and natural child. Again, that's what we come in the world with. And then there's also the adapted child, and which is how we learn to adapt to the information and misinformation that we get, get from this world around us. So that's the child ego state. And um, then the adult is the part of us that functions like a computer and processes information externally and also internally. And then we develop the parent ego state, which again has the, is where we uh, dis make decisions about how we're gonna live in the world based on the environment in which we exist. And I, it, and I think that as we talk about the developmental model, you'll see that Often we develop our initial parent ego state with limited information. And so part of the journey of becoming culturally aware is recognizing what pieces of my parent did I internalize that are not health, helpful and what, and what new information might I gain. So when you're talking to Deco about in Japanese culture, traditional culture might, there, there, there's probably a reason that the culture evolved in such a way. You talked about humility, for instance. And so coming as an adult, I can use my adult ego state to understand how come I caught what I caught and what is functional or not functional for me right now. Before you move forward, can you explain NP and CP? Yeah, nurturing parents, yes. The nurturing parent is the part of us, that when, we talk, when you talked about the spit studies and they discovered that children who weren't being nurtured physically were less likely to survive. So the nurturing parent is the source of both physical and psychological nurturing and support. And again, we talk about the fact that we can also be over-nurturing, and yet to have the enough nurturing is critical for our psychological health. And so you, you all who work with us know that we spend a lot of time, because oppression is a cultural level message of non-nurturing, right? Mm -hmm. That certain groups are not okay. And so to the extent that all of us have been the targets of that, we may have in our parent, we may not have enough nurturing parent around how to counteract those kinds of messages. So the developing of an effective and healthy nurturing parent is a critical part of our personal and our cultural liberation. At the same time, the critical parent or controlling parent is the part of us that is, can be shaming and that can, that's never around, can be neglectful, that doesn't take care of us. And, when, and, and the critical parent can also be functional in, to the extent that we need to set limits on ourselves and that people need to set limits on us. So each of these functions can, has, a, has both functional and sometimes not functional components. And I have yeah. one more clarifying question for those of us who are really new to this. Mm -hmm. Can you just briefly explain what do you mean by ego state? An ego state is a consistent, coherent system of feelings and thoughts along with a correlated set of behavior patterns. So that when, as you notice the participants there or if you notice your own child, 
the, it's, the, it's the, all the ways in which we express feelings is consistent and coherent. I feel sad, I know what that feeling is. I feel scared, I feel angry, I feel happy. That's the, that's the child ego state. And, and as you said, Van, all of us have that. All of us, I mean, we now know, I, I was interested in remembering the um, original work around the brain, because we now know that the limbic system, that the, brain, that the feelings are wired into the limbic system in all of us as human beings. So how do we access those feelings? And that's the, that's the, chi that's the child. The adult is um, a consistent, coherent system of thoughts and feelings about thinking. How it, so as I'm talking to you right now, I am processing through my cognition. I'm thinking, and that's a when I do that, this is how I do it. And each of us has a way of doing our thinking that is consistent and coherent. And then the parent is where I have internal incorporated the values, beliefs, attitudes, and opinions of the folks in my initial family and of the people around me and my teachers and the community in which I live. And, and the, it's ego states because uh, he came from a Freudian uh, theoretical base which had super ego, ego, and id. And Byrne was interested in the ego behaviorally, and so the parent kind of incorporated the superego, and the child incorporated part the id. So he was most focusing in the in the function of the ego, and that's why it's ego states. Yeah, these are different states in which the ego is manifested from moment to moment. Freud described as the ego, a conscious part of the personality, is made up of three distinct states that represent who the person was as a child, that's the child ego state, who the person is in the present, and who the person's parents were. So that's another way to think about the, the model. Yeah. Just to clarify the parent ego state, from the exercise, my understanding was that it is how you feel you were represented in your parents' mind. Mm -hmm. So I'm confused, is it, is it who your parents were? Like channeling, when you're in that ego state, are you channeling your parents' yeah. Yes. Values, beliefs, or are you channeling the way that they perceived you? We internalize all three ego states of our parents, their parent, adult, and child. And all of those are in our parent ego state. So in the parent, in, in my grown-up parent ego state, are the parent, are the, it, it's, it's like a video, I'm like a, it's like a video recorder. So I walk around the world noticing the adults around me and internalizing how they do things. And then they become my, me, yes. So that's the parent of the, of the I would say the parents, the, the parents, parent ego state, in, in my, it, the parents, parent ego state, I would change that from mother, father to just say parent, parent ego state in terms of culturally responsive. And then the parents, adult ego state, and the parents, child ego state. So in my head, in my parent, are all of the, are the re video recordings of all of that, that become a part of me. So I don't know if you notice that sometimes you might, I might find myself saying, God, I sound just like my father, mm -hmm. right, right? So that's the parent of my father that's in me, right? Yeah, okay? And culture is incorporated too. So again, in fact, the notion of cowboy and Indian, right? That's a cultural thing in the United States. How many, how many of us, my father used to watch those car cowboy movies every Saturday? I was watching that. So there's no, that's why we say more is caught than taught in the parent, mm -hmm. at the cultural level because we're just going around as young people noticing what's happening. And I can remember many instances, instances where, as I look back, I, saw, I was catching things about my okayness and other people's okayness just from the way my parents were behaving. Okay, we're gonna continue now with a discuss the discussion of structural analysis. And um, we, what we just talked about before the break was how, what becomes part of the parent ego state, which is the, and if you think again about your, as a child, I am going through the world, uh, walk, being primarily in child ego state, and I'm starting to discern the world around me, which is the beginning of the development of the adult ego state, as I start to notice things. And I'm also starting to videotape what the big people around me do. And, that's, and that gets incorporated into the parent so that I get rules for what to believe, which is the parent in the P3, 
has speaks to rules about what to believe that I come to see. The A3 in the parent is rules about how to think. And the C3 are rules about how to feel. So growing up, and, 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 one, and this is an important piece to look at culturally. So in Japanese culture, you might pick up certain rules about how you, how you must be as a person, is, is humble, right? In, in my, growing up in my community in the 50s, because of the, of the racial climate, I caught certain rules about it's not okay to, to express anger. Anger can be dangerous, literally. I was born four years after Emmett Till was killed in North Carolina. Graham and I were just discovering that he grew up right near where I grew up on the other side of town. We never knew that in all those years. We didn't talk about that. So that's a whole conversation we're going to have more about. But, but um, so I got certain rules in my parent about how to feel, rules about how to think. My father was a school administrator. And he was very, um, it was very important to him that you think about something, then that you learn from your experiences. So that is incorporated in my parent ego state. Um, and in terms of, uh, my father also liked to play, had a lot of free child energy. So I got a lot of permission to laugh and to have fun and to uh, dance uh, and to enjoy sports. They were sports you know, fanatics. I started to say addicts, but fanatics. <laughs> <laughs> and so that is what, that's how, and, and so as you think about your own parent ego state and those three, those three pieces, you can begin to discover what are the messages that I carry in my parent about each of these things. And so for me, what, one of the pieces of healing is about finding my voice and my anger as okay, right? Okay, so that's the parent. Then the adult develops, if I remember correctly, we say by the age of 12, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, it, and, so I, and I have the capacity to think. And when I am born as a little person in the child ego state, so I'm looking now at the P1, we are born with a magical parent that is, well, let's start the other way. We put, let's we'll put them all up then, because I, I go from C1 up. So, so C1 is the infant. So uh, Sol Solo? Is that we have a one, one infant here? Uh, is he, is he, are they in the room? No, okay. They could be in the room if they want to be in the room for this. It's really okay. <laughs> it's okay. We, need, we got a real child, two year old, two year old. <laughs> and they, and so that'll be cute. That would be cool. That would be cool if they want to be in the room. It's, it's okay. So the infant in us, and in many cultures, when there is teaching like this happening, in African cultures, for instance, in, in um, Beginning Fasau, I took a, 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 spent a lot of time learning from a guy, um, Maladoma Somme, and children are invited into spaces like this, and they learn to sit, listen, and hear, and intuit. And often the professor will say, after doing an hour lecture, what did you pick up, Salo? And the child will say what they think and feel. It's amazing. It was really powerful, because I know it in my head, but living with that experience through a two-year training program just taught me so much about what you were talking about how children have so much access to intuition, which is another way that I see that we learn about intuition, um, Isak, is that the, the infant in us uh, is what we come in the world with and it is what we want to access. And so in meditation and in other quiet spaces, we can connect with that C1. And then we also c come into the world with or develop shortly this little professor, I think come into the world with, which is the intuitive way that the child knows how to get fed and knows how to get attention. So we, um, the, you know, children cry to get attention. Some, you know, you have different cries, different sounds that, res that allow us as adults to know that what their needs are. That's what we call the little professor, the intuitive self in the child. And so when we talk about intuition, that's another word we use is I, I want to access the little professor in me. Or my little professor is saying this or that. So that's another, that's in the child ego state. So part of the work about being in my child is understanding those nuances. And then also in the child is what's called the magical parent. And this one has had a whole lot of debate in the organization. And the, the way I think about it is this is the, this is the incest taboo. This is the, the, the part of us that screams when we're being hurt. It's the part of us that is a, the child's a way of a, attempting to survive. 
I saw a thing on the news last night about two children who were left in a car and they died from heat exposure. And I was thinking how the little professor is not effective around something like as big as a hot, hot car. And yet, if you are with your children and they are in stress, they let you know it if you're with them, right? So that's the, I think of that as the magical parent. And so that is in all of us as we are born. And we need the, we need the support of adults as infants in order to, op to grow into the use of those other two pieces of ourselves. The infant is needs, most needs and natural feelings and natural inclinations. The adapted child, the, the, little. the little professor is the intuitor that picks up how I should handle those needs and feelings. So the little professor is intuiting what the natural child is needing and wanting and feeling. So how the structure develops is the next piece. When we are born, the, the infant is what is, exists from birth to the first six months. So when, when, if you think about Silo's journey so far in life, uh, from conception to birth, so before conception, is the, if you see the C1 and it says P-O-A-O -O and C-O, which is speaking about the point of conception. We have another baby evolving in this room too. Uh, that uh, <laughs> Angel, who's four months pregnant, so that, that, that's, where that one, that's where that baby is. Uh, and then we go to um, C1, which is the, when the baby is born for the first six months. And you know that I was reading this morning about uh, in Hawaiian culture, uh, and this is true in many, many indigenous cultures, that babies for the first six months are taken care of by the whole village, not just one, two parents or even or one parent, and so that they have lots of opportunities to just be held, which is the alter, which is the, which is, that's a little too dark, yeah. Uh, so, so that, um, so that their, their capacity to be healthy is enhanced by the physical touching and the continual way that they can be taken care of. So that's the C1. And then we develop the little professor shortly thereafter. As the child gets toward the six month mark, they are starting to develop that intuitive capacity to take care of their own needs. So, they know, so that they will cry when they're wet or they will cry when they're hungry. So that they are intuitively already learning to take care of their needs. And those of you who do it, since Cassandra does a lot of work with early childhood, at zero to, two, to, to three, two, and you will see even there differences in how children do this. And you will also see differences in children's capacity and skill at doing this. And a lot of early intervention work is about helping children develop, you develop and supporting that part rather than cutting it out like you were talking about. And then we move on in our development toward the P1, which, which is between the, the magical parent. A2, A2 develops next. Okay, oh, I see. Go up to A, yeah, A2 already starts while this is happening. So as once the little professor happens, then A2 starts to happen. So we start to, that's in the development of language. So that starts at about 18 months to three years. And then also the magical parent, that is the part that is like, that controls our, inst our instincts that are not healthy, develops between three and six years. So by the time the child is three, you're likely to see these aspects of self. And then the parent ego state, so one of the exercises we sometimes do is watching a, you watch a two-year-old trying to parent a dog, trying to get a dog to do something, and then you watch an eight-year-old, and you'll see the differences in the, how the parent ego state has developed. Right? So the, the two-year-old won't be as successful as the, as the eight-year-old typically. Yeah. I had a question about the parent. Um, I was understanding from before that the parent is really about how we get enculturated. And I'm curious why start at six? And, and my sense is that people learn a lot of rules about society, about race, about gender well earlier than that. So how, how are you defining that? Yeah, it's like from birth on we have a video camera running. And we are internalizing mother and father's parent, adult, and child. Um, we don't start to use that 
socially or actively until about eight years of age. Around eight, kids will begin to tell parents everything they've ever told them not to do that they shouldn't do, they'll tell the parent. Don't put your elbows on the table or you know, uh, don't chew with your mouth open or those kinds of things. So the child begins to use it socially and actively to parent themselves and other people around eight years of age. So eight, eight to 10. Before eight, uh, as Valerie was talking about, a, a child can say sit to a dog all day and the child will ignore them. The dog, At, the dog I mean, the excuse dog me, the dog, dog will ignore them. At about eight to 10, they can say sit and the way they have enough power in their parent to make the dog do that. And, th and that's not to say that children aren't aware. So it, the, that's the adult, though. In the adult ego state, I start noticing difference, race, gender, how some people are treated versus other people. I start noticing that from my adult ego state. So children are really, um, th that really uh, very aware, and they start talking about it. So I'm thinking about, um, I, I'm telling Jamila, I'm going to tell a story about Jamila. My daughter is here in the group. And when you were about six, we were on a bus here, here at RDU going to Rocky Mount, which is where I grew up, 56 miles east of here. And we talk about race in our family all the time. So we got on the bus, and Jamila was looking around, observing, and she said, Mom, why are all the people on the bus white? And the response on the bus was like, you would have thought she said, nobody has, the, the emperor has no clothes. I mean, the bus, <laughs> there was so much tension in the bus. Because again, her intuition, she spoke as a, you know, from her, her, her child legal state. And, the, and I noticed, and I saw her look of fear. Did I do something wrong, right? And I said out loud for everybody to hear, Jamila, we adults do not know how to talk about race. You didn't do anything wrong. So that was my way of you know, addressing a social reality that I didn't control because I can't make all those people on that bus get comfortable with race. That's why it's social and it's caught, right? Because I can't, we can't interrupt all of those things and yet we, as we become more conscious, we can be an anecdote, right? That's being an ally to the child and her, right? And challenging the adultism that would say, if I'm quiet, she's gonna take a different, potentially take a different kind of message.